I'm not all that important. I'm not all of that. Um, and I really don't have that much impact or effect on other people. But I, I want to sort of challenge that mindset. I want to challenge maybe the way that you perceive yourself and the, you perceive how you influence or whether you influence other people. And to think about this is that, um, are you married? Do you have a spouse? Do you have kids or grandkids or great grandkids? Do you have a circle of friends, people that you hang out with and are a part of that uh, social group? Or do you um, live in a neighborhood, have neighbors, other people around you that you talk to and uh, interact with? Um, do you go shopping? Do you uh, buying gas is, you know, you don't influence anybody on that, right? Unless you're like mad. So, or you go and get the candy bar in the store, right? Every one of us is a person of influence. And, and we minimize oftentimes the, the amount of influence that, that we have, but we are people of, of influence. Now, as being a, a church, a gathering of people who are seeking to follow Jesus, one of the things that Jesus makes it clear when, when we become followers of him is, is that there's this expectation that we would be influencers of other people to know and to follow Jesus as well. He makes that really clear in some of his last words that he says, what we call and refer to in the church as the Great Commission in Matthew 28, where he's speaking to his disciples there in front of him, but it is a command that, that transcends that group to include everybody who is a follower of Jesus. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That what you are to do is, is that you are to influence people to know and to follow me from this point on. And and baptizing them and, and teaching them everything that I've taught you. And oh, by the way, I'm going to always be with you. I'm, I'm always going to be present. This isn't a solo journey that you will always have my presence and my power with you. So followers of Jesus influence and help other people to follow Jesus. But here's another question. Do you, do you know how to do that? Are you... Is there intentionality? Is there a way that you are thinking about how can I influence the people around me? Because I am an influencer and, and depends on just God's gifting upon you. It depends upon uh, the blessings that you've had upon your life. It depends upon just some circumstance of how broad of an influence that you are going to have, what kind of uh, place that God is going to put you. But Every person is an influencer of others. And are you influencing on purpose? Is there an intentionality to what you are doing? And this morning we're beginning a, a series where I want to challenge you and invite all of us that we would embrace Jesus' model of influence. That when we look at the, the life and the story of Jesus, I think that there is a, a fairly clear model there that we can see and that we can also take for our own lives in order that we can be intentionally following Jesus and influencing other people in their, in their life. And influencing people in the way that Jesus intended, the way that Jesus desired and, and wants us uh, to help other people to know him and to follow him. One of the words that is oftentimes used in the Bible or is oftentimes used in the church or people's writings about following Jesus of what this is called as being a disciple or discipleship. And that word can scare, <laughs> can scare parents, it can scare you know, spouses, it can scare people and say, you know, I can't, I can't do that. But what I want us to do over these next few weeks is to, to take some time to dive a little bit deeper into understanding how did Jesus influence the people that were around him, and then how could we translate that into our lives? And the way that Jesus influenced people was this, is that he, that he started with following Jesus, and then Jesus taught them there was knowing Jesus and, and knowing the kingdom of God and what God's purposes and Jesus's purposes were in the world. And then um, 
And then within that is, is to show that Jesus showed his disciples what a kingdom of God life looked like, that he did these miracles and he uh, did these, uh, these acts of, of wonder, uh, but he also interacted with people in such a way to show his disciples that this is the way that Jesus works. This is the way the kingdom of God functions in the world. But then he sent his disciples to go and to do the things that he showed them and that he taught them out there. And the disciples went out and that occasionally failed miserably. And they came back and said, well, Jesus, you taught us. You said to do this and you showed us to do this. And we tried to do that and it didn't work. What happened? And Jesus coached them to help them to understand, oh, well, what you didn't quite get was this. And I'm using that word coach in, a, in, a, in the sense that all good coaches bring out the fullest potential of the person that they are coaching. And within the realm of, of faith, within the realm of Jesus, is that Jesus always brought out the greatest person that God had planted and put into each person. He brought to fruition that seed of, of life and of faith that was in that unique personality created in the image of God. And so as we dive into this model of influence and looking at Jesus of, of follow and know and show and go and, and coach, what we're going to do is, is that we're going to look at Jesus and how he did that. And then we're going to look at us and how does that work? How does that actually function in the place that I live, in the place that I work, in the neighborhood that I live, in the family that I interact with, in the, in the, the hard people to love and to be around, in the easy people to be around and, and to love. What is that going to, to look like? And so this morning, we're going to begin with looking at what does it mean to, to follow Jesus, that beginning point. And if you have your Bible, I want you to open it up to the Gospel of John. So uh, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels or the four books that tell the story of Jesus' life. And every one of them captures this invitation that Jesus gives to his first disciples to begin to follow him. John tells it in just a little bit of a different way, a unique way. I want us to dive into that, but encourage you to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well at some point to, to see how that interaction happens. But we're going to be looking at John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. If you have your Bible, I want you to open it up there. Um, it's page 758 if you're using the Bible on the chair near you in the, uh, there, or you can open up your phone or your tablet or whatever electronic device you're using or your Bible that you brought with you. John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. Let me read to you this down through 51 of Jesus' interaction. The next day again, John, and and the reference here is John the Baptist. Um, So John the Baptist came before Jesus. He was proclaiming the way, preparing the way. This is not John, the author of the book that we're writing. It's John the Baptist. The next day again, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, 
I saw you. And Nathanael answered Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, one of the things about the Gospel of John, this, this, this book that John writes to, to capture the life of Jesus, is that chapter 1 sets these themes that are then unpacked throughout the whole book. And so the, the things and the way that John has shaped his story and that he has told his story are going to help us to understand that really the whole of, of Jesus' life. And there are important elements in there that we're going to look at a little bit more deeply. But one of the first questions here is, is, it, is this question of who are you following? And right there at the beginning, verses 35, 36, and 37, where it paints this picture of John the Baptist having his disciples, having his followers is this reminder that, that, that everybody follows, right? That, that we're all followers. And for John the Baptist, that he came before Jesus, if you know sort of the biblical stories, that he came before Jesus, and his job was to prepare the way for Jesus. And so he had this um, sort of this message of repentance, of, hey, turn because you guys have gone the wrong way. And John the Baptist, when you read about him, he probably would have struck it. If he was sh- showed up here today, we would have thought, you're a little bit weird, all right? Um, because he lived in the desert, so he was an, an introvert and sort of uh, out there by himself. And he uh, ate uh, locusts and honey, which that, you know, sort of the vegan diet. I guess not. If you're going to eat locusts, that's not vegan. Right? But it's sort of this strange diet, right, you know, that he was doing. Uh, he wore um, these camel, you know, fur, you know, thing, clothes. Uh, I've been close to a camel. I don't remember his hair, but it sounds a little bit strange, right? Um, but he had this message, and it probably came across pretty strong of repent, for the kingdom of God is near, and then he baptized people that were saying, yeah, you know, things are going the wrong direction, we're going to follow, and, they, and he had his followers. And in this story, we see that he's walking with a couple of his followers, and his followers see Jesus. Now, you see, we're all followers, Every one of us, and, and, and to understand this, we have to understand that what shapes our thoughts, what shapes our attitudes and our actions, whatever shapes our worldview, that is what we are following. And everybody is a follower. So one of the, the things that social media has caught this, right? I mean, they sort of encapsulate that. So if you're on Facebook, what do you do? If you want to connect with somebody, you follow them, right? And you gauge somebody's, you know, status by how many followers they have. And particularly the celebrity crowd, right? You know, it's all about how many followers. And so you have Facebook and Instagram is similar or, or Twitter, you know, that you follow these news feeds or you follow. And then so once you get on that social media platform and then you um, have these followers, then everybody gets, gets to see how wonderfully perfect your life is, right? Because everybody on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they're all, well, not Twitter, but uh, they're all perfect, right? You know, that you got the, the perfect kids who have the perfect grades in school, and you have the perfect marriage, and you have the perfect vacation, you have the perfect house, you have the perfect car, because that's what people only put on there is all the perfect things. And then you feel lousy about yourself, and you have depression, and you have to go on medication, and then you have to go off of Facebook. <laughs> and you think this following thing isn't all that great of a deal, is it? What's going on here? You see, we, we follow and we are influenced, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions are influenced by the people around us, those that we follow. And we live, did you know we live in a political world as well? That politics is about shaping the, the thoughts, attitudes, and actions of others, of the worldview. And so if you're a Democrat, then you, there are people that you follow, and those are shaping the way that you see life and the way that you interpret events. 
Or if you're a Republican, then the same way. This is that there's a, a shaping that goes on there. Or if you're a libertarian, then there's a shaping and understanding a worldview of the way things should be and the way things are and the difference between those and what you need to do about it. Or if you're a news person, if you listen, um, you know, listen to or watch Fox News, then you are being shaped by an agenda. If you are watching MSNBC, you are being shaped by an agenda. There's, there's no neutral platform out there, just so you know, that everybody's coming from an angle. They are coming from a, a position, a place of influence that we are being shaped. If you are a sports person, particularly your football, a professional football, you're like, yeah, finally something to watch on TV, right? You know, you're shaped by those, that, that team and those personalities that are, that are going on there. Or if you're a person of faith, that you are shaped by those associations that you make. And sometimes those are bigger de- associations that would, was what denominations or denominations are about or these different expressions of of faith. We are all followers. We are shaped by the influencers that are in our life. Now, the really interesting thing is, is that most of us, whether we admit it or not, we like to have followers. We like people that that are going to follow us. And and so when we see this story where John the Baptist is walking with two of his disciples, and and John the Baptist sees Jesus and calls him out and says, hey, there's the Lamb of God, And two of his disciples spin off and start following Jesus and asking him, where are you going? You would expect John to go, hey, wait a second. I'm the guy you want to follow. Come come this way. You don't don't want to go. I was just pointing him out. You don't need to go that way. Just come this way. You see, particularly when when we have these religious types of of pictures here of, of leaders, then it becomes about following me. I was looking at this news story here this last week about a big gathering that's happening down in Mexico of a, uh, of, of a church and expression of, that has, they say they have 1.8 million um, uh, followers. And it's sort of this interesting, very fundamentalist expression of, of, uh, of Christianity. But then I was reading, it's like, okay, the leader sees himself as the last apostle of Jesus. And you're going, ah, red flag. And it says, hey, follow me, follow me. And one of the, the, the things that happens here is, is that we, we see as, as, as these disciples peel off and they begin to follow Jesus and it, and it shifts from John the Baptist to Jesus is, I don't know if you began to notice that Jesus is referred to in a number of different ways in this short passage. I mean, it's, it's just really rich to be able to get to understand who Jesus is. And so it begins in in verse 36 where John the Baptist says, he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God goes back into the story in the Old Testament of the deliverance from the Egyptian captivity. And that when uh, the angel of death came through that night, that those who, who had the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts, on their doorstep, the angel of death went over them and they were saved. That in, in, in all of that imagery to a Jewish person was brought in when John said those words, this is the Lamb of God, that he is your redeemer, that he paid the price for your sins so that you are safe. And then in verse 38, it says, Jesus turned and saw them following him, said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Rabbi, John translates, is his teacher, that Jesus is your teacher, that he knows the truth. In fact, Jesus t- says about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That if you are confused, if you need to know what is right or the direction or the thing that you should be doing or the, uh, the, the direction that you should be going, that you can turn to Jesus, that he is the teacher, he knows the truth, he knows what it is that you need and that you can trust him and depend upon him, that whatever Jesus tells you will be right. It may not be safe, but it will be Right? That Jesus is the, the Messiah. In verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found Messiah, which means Christ. Again, John sort of tra- translates from a Jewish crowd to a, a Gentile crowd. So Messiah 
and Christ both mean the same thing. It means Savior. Is that he is your Savior, that he's powerful enough to deliver you. Again, goes back into that story of the Old Testament of the deliverance from, from the Egyptians. Is, is that, that Moses was the one who led them out, that Jesus is the Savior. He's the one who leads us out into the, in, of captivity into the promised land. And then down in verse 45, it says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law, also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, that he is the one who is promised. That he is the one who, that you're looking for, that you've been waiting for, that he always has been. That Jesus is not this sort of new you know, thing on the scene, but he is the eternal one. And you go back into John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, is it captures this idea of the eternal, eternality of Jesus, which also ties us back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. You see, there's this eternality there that Jesus is the promised one. He's the one that we've been waiting for. And then in verses 49 through 51, Nathanael answered, Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the beloved one, and that he is the king of Israel. He is the powerful, the all-powerful one, that he makes us the beloved because he is the beloved one, that he is the one who can be trusted because he is the Lord. He is the king over all things. He is the ruler that we can have confidence in, that we can have trust in. And particularly this last story here of this interaction with Nathaniel brings up a theme that is going to run throughout John's gospel. There's, this, uh, there's these references that Jesus makes. Um, in, in order to, to sort of be grounded in it, you have to turn back to Genesis chapter 25 through 28, where there's a story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was um, referred to or called the deceiver because Jacob, even if he, um, if telling the truth was a better thing, that he would always tell a lie. He, he, was, a, he was just a, a liar, a deceiver uh, of all things, and that he got into such conflict with his brother Esau that his brother was going to literally take his head off. And so Jacob had to run and he had to hide. And there was this amazing divine encounter that Jacob had with God where his name was changed to Israel. And, and so we see that within that, uh, the, the birth of this, this nation and this whole righteousness that comes because of the, the grace of God in Jacob's life. And Jacob builds a, 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 an altar. He builds a place of worship. And is, he called it Bethel, which is the house of God. And so within the Old Testament, this idea of temple the idea of temple is, is it's the place where heaven and earth met together. And that's why the, the temple is so important to the Jewish people because there's this disconnect between God. There's this distance between God and, 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 and us because the temple isn't there to be that, that place where heaven and earth, where God meets his people. And within that, what happened is with Jacob, there was a vision of angels on a ladder going up and down between heaven and earth. And that's what Jesus refers to here when he says to Nathaniel, he says, ah, here's an Israelite in whom there is no deception or no deceiver, that he's going back to Jacob. And then he paints this picture of this vision that Jacob saw because one of the things that Jesus says and Jesus makes clear is, is that he is the one who is the bridge between heaven and earth. He is the one where we, the people here, meet God. He is the temple. That's why, you know, at one point in Jesus' story, he talks about, he says, you know, tear down this temple. And he's talking about this massive building. He says, in three days, it will be built up. And they're like, you're crazy, Jesus. Because they didn't understand that Jesus was the place. He was the person where heaven and earth met. All of this richness about that's being revealed within these interactions, within these invitations that Jesus is giving. 
And at the bottom of it, at the base of it, is Jesus is saying to those disciples, he's saying to those people that he encountered, dare, do you dare to come and see? Do you dare to come and see? In verse 39, in verse 46, in verse 39, Jesus said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. So those are the two disciples with John the Baptist. And then Nathanael, he says, Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. You see, a lot of times we don't know what to do. We care deeply about people and we want them to connect with, with Jesus. We want them to be people of faith. We want them to have a relationship with God and we don't know how to do that. But at the most basic and the most simple, we see here it is inviting people to come and to see Jesus. Now, here's the deal. This is it. Trust is the doorway into relationship. If you're going to enter into any relationship in life, that it begins with trust. And you have to have a certain level. You have to make a choice, a decision of trust in order to move towards somebody in relationship. Now, we always hold back some, right? We don't put ourselves fully in there because we're testing the waters to see, is this somebody or is this a relationship that I truly, really can trust? But trust is a doorway into relationship. And if you're going to come and see, if you're going to accept that invitation that Jesus says, then the first thing you have to do is you have to be willing to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself that you don't know everything. That there is something that you are seeking. That there is something that is greater than you. That you have to to humble yourself that this this emptiness, this, as one philosopher said, this God-shaped void within your soul that you've been trying to fill with all kinds of different things, that there is one that maybe is in the shape of that void. You have to humble yourself. And then you have to face your fear. See, because when we come and see Jesus, then what we're afraid of is is that Jesus is going to do something to us or make us do something that is the worst thing that we could think of in our life. Like within, um, when I was in college, you know, sort of the joke was is that, you know, if you're really committed to Jesus, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to send you as a missionary to Africa because that was sort of, you could think that, you know, people's like, oh, that's a horrible place. I've been to Africa multiple times. Africa's an awesome place. Probably for us, it would be God's going to, Jesus is going to send you to the Middle East, right? Pakistan or Afghanistan or something like that. You know, he's going to put you right in the middle of a, a hostile Muslim population and, and you're going to end up being a martyr. There's this fear that if we really follow Jesus, he's going to do the worst to us that we can think. And you have to get beyond that because it's a, this misconception that Jesus wants to hurt you. He wants the worst for you, not the best for you. And then you have to have the willingness to say, will you teach me? Will you teach me, Jesus? Will you be my rabbi? That I don't know everything. I, I've, I've got... I've got things that I have to understand, I need to understand, and you're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. I, will you teach me? One of the beautiful pictures in here that is important for us to point out in this whole idea of following Jesus is the, the deep love of Jesus that is shown by the fact that he knows these disciples' name. I don't know if you caught that. In John 142, when Andrew brings his, his brother Simon, he's brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, which means rock. It's translated rock. And, and Jesus not only knows his name, but he gives him sort of this secret name. He says, this is, this is who you are. You are the rock. Later on, Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell cannot stand against it, as he's looking at Peter, of Peter's role in God's kingdom work. And then, and then this whole interaction with, with Nathaniel of Jesus looking at Nathaniel and saying, hey, I, I knew you, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's like, whoa, how did, how did you know me? See, here's the thing is that Jesus knows you. 
Jesus knows your name. And, and we all have a sense of how important it is that somebody would know our name, right? We want to be people who somebody knows us. My wife, Pam, uh, she, uh, before she became a seventh grade science teacher, uh, she taught at the community college. And she would do this sort of trick uh, at the beginning of the semester. So she'd have all these new students, people that the um, vast majority of them she'd never met before, didn't know. Uh, so 30, 35 students in a class. And then she would have them introduce themselves. And so they would go and introduce themselves. And without writing anything down, then she would go and she would tell them each their name. Right after they all introduced themselves. My wife is the smartest in our family, just by I just want you to make, make that clear. And, and, you know, and people are like, whoa, you know, wow, you know, you, you knew my name. And then she would actually remember it, right? And there's something within us that knows that how important it is to, to know our name. There's a guy, um, Tim, and he goes to our first service, who I thought was Keith for the, forever, until I kept saying, hey, Keith, how you doing? He's like, finally, he goes, it's Tim. I'm like, oh, dang. You know, because I try to remember people's names. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I want to know your name, and, and I may get it wrong, but I just dive in. Because most of us were like, I don't know your name. I'm not going to take the risk. If I call you by the wrong name, it's just because I'm trying, all right? So, you know, uh, just, just tell me. that It's like, no, nope, sorry, got it wrong. <sighs> I'll figure it out, okay? Because we want to be, we want to be known. And Jesus knows your name. It shows his love for you. It shows that invitation. So influence comes from who influences you. You want to be an influencer. Look at who's influencing you. Who has shaped you? Who is shaping you now? Do you know the, the answers to those questions? Do you know what are the, the people and the influences that have shaped you into who you are right now? Do you know the, the pressures that are being influenced or putting on, upon your life that are shaping your life right, right now? And if you want to be a, live a life on purpose, if you want to be an in, a person of influence for Jesus, then influence starts with following Jesus. One of the things that we talk about here at Cold Springs Church is that, and it's a part of our vision, is, is that raising up 10,000 local, national, and international leaders who will live and lead out of the overflow of a Jesus-trusting life, resulting in restored and strengthened families. That there's an influence that has a result, that has a fruit, but that influence comes from a, a deep connection to Jesus and the overflow of that. In John 1.43, it says, Next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. I'm reading through the book of Acts, um, and I was struck by Philip. Philip shows up there at the beginning of the book of Acts. He's one of these highly influential people in the story of the beginning of the church. He was a highly influential people because he lived out of the overflow of being deeply connected to Jesus. That Jesus simply gave him an invitation and said, follow me. And so the question for you is, is it, are you, will you follow Jesus? Have you, have you made that step? Have you, have you humbled yourself? Is there an openness, a willingness to, to be taught by Jesus? Or have you confronted your fear that if you follow Jesus, what's going to happen to you? And here at Cold Springs Church, the, the way that we talk about following Jesus is we talk about saying yes to Jesus. And you may have noticed there's a card there in chair in front of you that says, say, say yes to Jesus. And it's this reflection of following Jesus in our life. And it's a prayer that I want to pray together this morning. And it's about admitting, admitting who we are, who you are, that there's a brokenness that needs to be filled, to be, to be healed, and believing Jesus and who he is, and then choosing to commit to, to follow, to say yes to Jesus. My question is, is that will you follow Jesus this morning? If you haven't ever stepped, he, he's saying the same thing to you, come and see just make that small step of coming and seeing. Make that step of trust, that step of faith. And he'll take you where you need to go. 
but he invites you to take that first step. And that first step is a prayer like this that reflects a heart being willing to trust him. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, today I admit that I am broken. I've sinned against you and against others, which has broken our relationship. And as much as I've tried to fix things myself, I know my way isn't working and that I need a Savior. I want to tell you I believe in you, and I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you lived, died, and are now alive. And I believe that you can save me, and it's only through your grace I can be made right with God. Nothing I do will make you love me more than you already do. And today I commit to follow you as much as I know how. I don't understand everything, but I do believe that you love me and you will lead my life. So I choose to follow where you lead. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for saving me, and being my king. And Jesus, thank you for influencing us and out of the overflow that we can influence the people in the world around us. Help us to be those kind of people, that the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, that fruit of the Spirit would overflow through us into a world to point them towards you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer this morning, on your welcome card, there's a place where you mark that. Could you just mark that and let us know? Because we want to come inside you and just encourage you and to help you in that, in that journey. Hey, um,